We are glad to greet you on the webinar of the campaign 146 by 24, which is conducted by the uh, TBEC and uh, ITPC in the EECA region. We are discussing, we are going to discuss the efforts to increase the efforts to liquidate TB by introducing the shorter and more efficient treatment regimens for and prevention regimens for TB. Today, Madeleine Nash, uh, Master of Science and member of the coalition 146 by 24, will present you a report which was prepared by Treatment Action Group. The report in Russian uh, and in English languages is also published on the website of ITPC and on the website of Treatment Action Group. I'll share the link in the chat box so that you would be able to read this report in more detail. After Madeleine makes her presentation, we will have time for questions and answers to the speakers and to discuss the suggestions or country barriers which prevent you from implementation of this campaign in your regions at a full scale. If you have questions during the presentation, please write them in the chat box. And now I'll give the floor to Alexandra Vasilenka, PR manager of TB Europe Coalition. So you're welcome. Dasha, thank you very much. Dear colleagues, hello. I'm glad to see you all today at this webinar. And on behalf of TPEC, I am greeting you within this webinar, uh, ABC of TB activists. We are conducting such educational webinars and discussing very relevant topics uh, related to TB. And uh, thanks to our partners from TBEC and uh, EECA and ITPC, and thanks to participation of uh, Madeleine Nash, our wonderful speaker, uh, we will be able to learn the results of introduction of this campaign, 146 by 24, in the uh, EECA countries. Uh, maybe you remember that last year in June, we already had uh, conducted a webinar during which we informed about this campaign, about this very important initiative related to the changing in the treatment regimens. And I will be glad to hear about the results which we managed to achieve, who managed to achieve what, who had which barriers uh, in the countries, so that we would be able to address these barriers. And I wish you all a fruitful webinar. Thank you, Alexander, for your introduction. And now I will give the floor to Denise Gutlevsky, regional coordinator of the uh, ITPC in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Uh, I'm glad to see you all. So, uh, and I understand that this topic is interesting for you, and we are glad that in collaboration with the EBEC, uh, we are able to present the uh, Russian and English versions of this report. And I'm using this opportunity to make an announcement about another initiative which will take place this year within our cooperation in summer it is expected in the end of july uh, we will uh, have another series of recruitment of uh, participants of smart tb cab and these are educational modules designed for several weeks during which you will be able to increase your knowledge about TB, about clinical studies, about uh, clinical and treatment protocols, about the activities of communities, about advocacy and so on. So please follow our announcement and announcements of our partners and submit your applications to participate in this educational series I see that uh, some of today's participants already took part in these uh, training webinars. And so I'm giving the floor to Madeleine. 
Thank you very much, Denise. And before giving the floor to our speaker, I would like to remind you how to change the language of the presentation. Uh, in the top right corner, you can select an icon uh, and select the view in Russian for which you should select Alexandra Vasilenka and to view presentation uh, in English, you should select uh, the screen of Alessia. And now uh, let's start this presentation, which is most interesting. And I'm giving the floor to our speaker, Madeleine, you are welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Daria. Can everyone hear uh, me? Да, спасибо большое. I think I maybe need to mute the translation. Is this working? Okay, excellent. Thank you, Daria. Thank you, Dennis, to all our colleagues at ECAT uh, for having us on this webinar and for organizing it so brilliantly. Um, and thanks to you all uh, for taking the time to be here. Um, so I'm really excited to share with you uh, about the 146 by 24 campaign and about the report that we recently released um, around the midpoint of the campaign in both English and Russian. Um, so you can advance to the next slide. So as you all know, thanks to, um, you know, now about two decades of renewed uh, investment in TB research and development, there are really exciting new innovations in the landscape of TB that allow TB to be treated um, in much shorter um, and safer and friendlier ways to, to patients. Yet the reality is that very few people um, have access to these new treatments um, compared to the number who need them. Um, and this lack of access um, is really, you know, an affront to fundamental human rights that, you know, does inspire outrage among the global TB community. And this is really the, the foundation upon which the 146 by 24 campaign was founded. Um, and don't worry, I'm going to get into to what the campaign and those numbers mean if they're not familiar to you. Um, next slide, please. So this will be very familiar to you all, but um, I think it's it's helpful to just really take stock of, of how far we've come in TB uh, to look at the length of time um, and the types of drugs needed to both prevent and treat different forms of TB prior to this, um, you know, uh, um, uh, in innovation in, in recent years. So where it took, you know, six months or more um, of drugs to, to prevent, um, you know, TB infection from becoming TB disease, uh, you know, six months, again, of treatment to treat drug susceptible TB and 18 months or more, you know, one and a half to two years to treat TB that is resistant um, to, to first line drugs. And now with these recent innovations, the, the short course regimens, we can now prevent TB in as little as one month, um, you know, or, uh, um, or three months uh, with uh, drugs taken weekly, and we can treat drug susceptible TB in as little as four months. So treatment time cut by a third. Um, and I think, you know, really significantly um, cutting the, uh, the treatment time for drug resistant TB again, um, by by a third and also removing some of the most toxic, um, dangerous drugs um, from the older regimens. So really a, a very significant um, amount of progress um, over the last couple of decades. Uh, next slide, please. So what does 146 by 24 mean? Um, so as I described on, on the last slide, we can now treat, uh, excuse me, prevent TB in as little as one month or by a once weekly dose of a medication over three months. So that represents the one. So these are regimens that are probably familiar to you. Um, 1-HP and 3-HP uh, regimens with uh, isoniazid and rifapentine or 3-HR, um, a, a three-month 
three month regimen with isoniazid and um, a rifampicin. So the four um, here, we're talking about treatment of drug susceptible TB. There are two different regimens that sort of fall under this category of four. This is four HPMZ, uh, which is a regimen to treat drug susceptible TB in adults and adolescents and for HRZE, which is a new regimen to treat children who have non-severe TB disease. Um, the six refers to the six-month regimen to treat drug-resistant TB. So this is uh, six months of BPALM or BPALM uh, or, or BPAL, um, depending on resistance to fluoroquinolones. And the 2024 stands for the idea was to achieve universal access to these new improved shortened regimens by the end of 2024, which is now the end of this year, um, just about six months from now. And also integral um, to the campaign is this idea that we need a, a, a fundamental sort of health infrastructure um, system to support the scale up of these regimens. Um, and in the campaign, we're referring to that as the staff, uh, staff space systems and supports, um, which Dr. Paul Farmer of Partners in Health talked about um, as, as sort of the critical foundation upon which, you know, the uh, human right to health could be achieved. And additionally, the campaign really emphasized priority research um, into gaps related to uh, the uh, administration of these um, shorter, better regimens in historically neglected populations from research like children, like pregnant and breastfeeding people. Next slide, please. Um, so, sorry, I think I'm getting in a language alert. Daria, is it still coming in clear? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so where are we now? So as I mentioned, the goal, uh, end goal for the campaign is 2024. Um, so if we sort of take a look back, this campaign was launched in mid 2022 um, by civil society actors, including Treatment Action Group, Partners in Health, Médecins Sans Frontières at the AIDS conference in 2022. Um, and since then, you know, a, a number of things have happened. Really critically has been the role of civil society organizations that have um, supported countries um, and civil society actors in countries to advocate for the inclusion of these 146 regiments in their um, proposals to the global fund in their national strategic plans um, and also to advocate for the importance of uptake of these new regiments at the UN high level meeting um, late last fall. So when we launched the report, which we did in English just a couple of months ago, it was around the, the just after the midpoint of the campaign, where we had only nine months left to really achieve these very ambitious goals. Um, and importantly, you know, we're also only a few years out from realizing the commitments that were made at the UN high level meeting. Um, so where are we now? We're in kind of a crunch phase for really scale, rapidly scaling up access to these regimens um, for everyone and especially in the places that need them most. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is the, uh, the image on the front of the campaign, uh, um, of the uh, campaign mid-campaign report, which we entitled Getting Better Faster. Um, and now since we're a few months past the launch of the English version, we're even that much closer to, to the end of the campaign, which is the end of this year, just a few short months uh, away. So there's really a sense of urgency um, among all people involved in the campaign uh, about um, um, you know, really doubling down on, on our efforts. So that's partly why I'm very excited to ECAT helped us organize this webinar so we can really bring in, um, you know, stakeholders and partners from all of the different regions that are going to benefit most from, from having the goals of this campaign uh, realized. Next slide, please. 
So um, in terms of the approach that we took for um, the report, we drew on a number of different data sources, uh, you know, the World Health Organization report, some data from um, MSF, from, from USAID, uh, and, but primarily um, the analysis that, that we undertook was looking at the funding requests that countries did submit to the global fund um, and, and seeing based on that, what countries' plans were and are to scale up these shorter um, regimens. So a lot of the data that I'm going to talk about um, over the next um, 15 minutes or so is really drawn um, from this analysis. Uh, and the detailed um, table, which I know is, is not easy to read on this slide, can be found in, in the report. Um, next slide, please. So jumping right in, I think there's really a lot of reasons to be optimistic about scale up of these one regimens. So this, this is the re shortened regimens for TB prevention. Um, most countries indicated plans to scale up 3HP in particular, um, which I think is very encouraging. And as you all may know, uh, the recent announcement last year um, of the child-friendly formulation for rifapentine um, is going to make offering these shortened prevention regimens to children that much easier. Um, and that really speaks to, I think, what the priority needs to be around the one regimen, which is improving coverage, uh, you know, among among children um, and among um other people that haven't historically been prioritized for uh, TB preventive therapy. So those over five years of age and not um, living with HIV. In uh, interestingly as well, 1HP doesn't seem to have, uh, you know, as um, widespread access, probably partly due to its higher cost. So also scaling up access to that regimen so people have options and can really choose what works best for them will also be important. Next slide, please. So um, compared to the one, you know, there is decidedly, you know, less progress to report on the four month regimens. Um, so this slide is specifically looking at 4-HPMZ. So this is the shortened regimen for drug susceptible TB for adults and adolescents. And we really wanted to dive into this regimen as part of our um, report and analysis because the gaps are, are so large. So um, one thing that we did was commissioned a modeling analysis to look at the potential impact of scaling up this four month regimen. Um, and the results of this regimen show that switching all eligible adults from the six month regimen to the four month regimen through the year 2030 would result in 76 million months. So that's 6.3 million years saved on TB treatment. And so um, what this sort of um, image shows is just all of the benefits that would be afforded to patients by having that amount of time of their life back and not having to have it, not having to be on TB treatment. Um, so it's really significant impacts, um, you know, things like spending um getting to spend more time with your family and your friends, um, getting, having a reduced burden for your care, uh, your caregivers, um, having to spend less time and less money going to and from the hospital. Um, so I think it's really important as we, you know, push for greater access to the four regimens to not, to, to really bring these benefits, um, you know, to the forefront. In addition um, to time saved, we also looked at cost saved, cost saved to patients. And again, the modeling analysis that we um, commissioned and included in our report shows that if all eligible people in just a sampling of countries in India and South Africa and the Philippines alone received this shortened regimen in one year, this year, 2024, they, uh, the patients themselves would save a cumulative um, $110 million in non-medical uh, expen expenses due to the shortened duration of treatment. 
So this is things like from lost wages and transportation costs. Um, and, you know, these savings would go a long way to realizing, you know, the UN targets, for instance, of avoiding catastrophic costs and really just taking, you know, this incredible financial burden off of, of patients. And, you know, we also expect there to be health system savings as well as de demand and volumes increase for these regimens and, and prices um, come down. So that's really the focus, um, I think, going forward uh, for, the, for the four regimen. Next slide, please. Um, so further uh, looking at the four, so this is the four regimen for kids with non-severe disease. Um, and, and, you know, this regimen is really a no-brainer because if you look at it, the regimen uses the exact same drugs as the original treatment regimen, the six months of um, uh, six HRZE. So, you know, recent research showed that that, that regimen um, can, with the same drugs, can be shortened by a third, so to four months, and still have the same efficacy for kids with non-severe disease. Um, so it's gonna be important for countries, I think, to realize the benefits um, you know, of that shortened duration. And we are seeing, in our analysis, we are see slowly seeing some interest in scaling up this regimen. And, and that's perhaps partly because 4-HRZE was included as a program essential by the Global Fund. Um, and, you know, the fixed dose combinations exist, the drugs already exist and are, are used, you know, routinely in, in countries in programmatic settings. So I think now the focus is on, you know, increasing awareness and demand for these regimens and also helping countries um, you know, figure out the best ways to adjust their national policies and their clinical and diagnostic algorithms to support the identification of kids with non-severe disease um, specifically. And I think there's a great case study in the report of how Kenya has done this really um, successfully. Uh, next slide, please. So turning to um, the sixth regimen for drug-resistant TB, so this is um, BPAL and BPAL-M, you know, out of all of the 146 regimens, I think we saw that country ambition and plans to scale up um, the six are really, uh, you know, among the highest um, out of uh, out of the 146 regimens. We um, looked at a few things here. We looked at procurement of protominid over the last few years um, from the GDF and see major increases. Um, you know, between 2022 and 2023, which is, you know, indicative of more countries using the BPALM regimen. And, and while that's encouraging, I think we also wanted to highlight that, um, you know, while we're seeing big increases, still the absolute numbers of procured courses are really just a frat represent a fraction of the people in need, the people who are being treated um, for drug resistant TB globally. And of course, that just represents a fraction of the need because we know, you know, only less than half of people with drug resistant TB actually receive a diagnosis and are therefore able to be treated. Um, so well, progress on the six is encouraging with the decreased regimen um, cost and um, you know the the scale up that we're seeing in in countries. I think it's important to um, you know look at it in the larger picture and realize there's still a long way to go um, to meet need. Next slide, please. So. Um, these are, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, a few of the foundational sort of cross-cutting elements of the campaign. One of those is a focus on historically neglected populations. So primarily um, in this case, children and pregnant people. And we, you know, if you look at the, at the past for TB, but also for other drugs, it's really abundantly clear that um, children and pregnant uh, women and people are often the last to be able to realize um, 
their right to benefit from scientific progress. So the 146 campaign was really cognizant of that and wanted to try um, and make an impact um, on that really unjust reality. Um, so the campaign called for um, very specific uh, research to fill gaps. And it's really exciting to the report. And in the report, we have a table um, that highlights all of those gaps. And um, I really encourage you to, to go look at that in detail. But I think um, going forward, some of the priorities are going to be really scaling up um, these new regimens that have recently, um, you know, been proven to be effective uh, out of the NTB trial and the beat, uh, TB South Africa trial and making sure that pregnant women have access to those regimens, um, given that that um, that they aren't able yet to safely take some of the other um, shorter uh, shorter regimens. Um, next slide, please. Another cross cutting act. Um, act aspect is really the um, access to diagnostics, which is a fundamental um, uh, part of the campaign, realizing that people can't receive better treatments unless they receive a diagnos diagnosis. Um, and our analysis of Global Fund concept notes shows that countries are scaling up um, rapid molecular tests and decentralized drug susceptibility tests. And this is very important, um, you know, not only for the six month regimen to treat drug resistant TB, but also for the um, shorter regimen to treat drug susceptible TB, given that um, for HPMZ, because it brings a fluoroquinolone into the first line of uh, TB treatment. Um, next slide, please. So we um, make a number of um, calls to action in, in the report um, for a variety of different stakeholders, um, including country governments. Uh, really the call there is for them to increase their investments for um, high burden, low income countries to increase their domestic investment in TB programs um, and for high income, low burden countries to increase their, their multilateral funding um, to support countries to scale up these shorter regimens. We make specific calls to the World Health Organization around um, for HPMZ because the gaps are so great there, both to track uh, and promote uptake of this regimen like they do for the other shorter regimens. We make calls to funding agencies to make investments in program quality, to support civil society um, for things like community-led monitoring, um, and to research, um, research funders as well to fund these needed studies for children and pregnant people. Some important calls are also made to market shaping actors, again, with a focus around 4HPMZ, looking at how we can most strategically shape the market um, for this better, but still more expensive, shorter regimen. Um, and then of course, um, there are the calls to industry um, to reduce the price of key drugs, specifically around um, delaminid, which is a key component in the re shortened regimens that are um, safe for pregnant uh, people uh, and children. Next slide, please. Um, so I think a really um, exciting component of the report is these case studies that we've done on country leaders um, who are really been successful in implementing some of these shorter regimens, some, you know, getting to at scale in their countries. Uh, and it's exciting that there are a number of countries in the um, Eastern um, European uh, region that were highlighted. So I'm just going to Quickly, Daria, am I doing okay for time? I have just a couple slides left. Okay, good. I'm just gonna highlight some of the, um, the countries in the region. So next slide, please. So one of the case studies is on the scale up of 4-HPMZ. So this is the shortened regimen for drug susceptible TB for adults and adolescents. Um, in Azerbaijan. Um, and uh, when we spoke to um, representatives from the NTP for this case study, they talked about the burden um, facing young, you know, working men, family men in their country and how 
really treatment adherence due to the length of treatment and the impacts it had on work was really significant um, for that population. And I think that's the uh, NTP talked about that being a motivation for wanting to find more person centered treatment, um, shorter treatment that was going to be able to support this specifically vulnerable population. Um, and so they are are slowly um, but surely scaling up the, the um, four month regimen for drug susceptible TB and they've offered it so far at the time of writing of the report to about 100 people in the general population and they're also um, working on rollout in the prison, um, the uh, population of incarcerated individuals as well. Um, and they also talked about plans to scale up other shorter regimens, including uh, for TB prevention and for drug resistant TB. Um, so I think that's a really exciting um, case study uh, in the report um, uh, that's worth going at and looking at. Next slide, please. And another country that's highlighted, not for a specific uh, regimen per se, but more in terms of being really a leading um, innovator um, in terms of rapidly adopting new policy. So this is Ukraine um, that, you know, has really led the way in terms of quickly adopting new WHO policies, even admits the, the war that's currently going on in the country, being able to um, being able to bring these new innovations in at scale um, is, is really an impressive feat that, that we wanted to highlight um, alongside also um, South Africa that has a, a different but um, equally impressive um, uh, way of scaling up rapid access to new innovation. Next slide, please. Um, and then quickly zooming in on the Global Fund, um, analysis for the countries um, that were included that are part of the Eurasian region, you can see that um, the, the region in terms of the countries that were included um, in, in the report doing well on rollout of the six, on diagnostics, on 3HP for TB prevention, and then the gap is really around the four regimens. So that's very, um, similar to what I think was observed for the majority of countries that were profiled in the report. This idea that the, the biggest gap is really around 4-HPMZ and 4-HRZE uh, for drug susceptible TB. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that there um, and encourage you to go look at it in detail in the report. And then just on to the last slide, so, um, you know, if there's one message I think to take away from the campaign and from this presentation is really that um, this work is very much grounded in and supportive of, um, you know, the goal to realize our shared human rights, most obviously the right to health um, enshrined in Article 12 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, but also uh, the right to science. Um, which is a separate article enshrined in, in um, uh, or a separate covenant enshrined, enshrined in Article um, 15. And, and, and that really says that governments have a duty to make available and accessible to all persons without discrimination, especially to the most vulnerable, the best available applications of scientific progress. And that's really what the 146 by 24 campaign um, is all about. So I think I'll, I'll leave it there and leave you with that message that hopefully inspires you um, in your advocacy to, to take forward um, the, the, um, the fight of this campaign in realizing the right to health, the right to science, and access to the best available TB um, prevention and treatment regimens. Thank you very much. Dear Madeline, thank you very much for uh, such thorough and useful presentation and uh, for your attention, which is very important for your special attention to the successes and the gaps and barriers 
faced by the EECA countries. And now we can switch to the discussion of the questions. Right now, we do not have questions in the chat box, but I hope that colleagues, I think that colleagues, if you have any questions or comments, you can ask them here or put them down, write them down in the chat box. Madeline, thank you very much once more. And David, yes, Madhu. feel free to come off mute or off video if you want to join me in, in answering any questions. David Brannigan from TAG is the co-author um, of this of this report. Так, у нас пока нет вопросов. Я спрошу. Right now, we do not have, we do not see any questions in the chat box. Maybe somebody wanted to ask something. Alexandra, Alessia, we, we can uh, stop the screen uh, demonstration. Uh, then possibly I will ask my first question, Madeline and possibly David, what would you recommend? Do you have any advice or recommendations to the countries which uh, could not achieve significant results now what should they start with possibly possibly you have answers to this question yeah that that's a great question i think um well, I guess our one of our hopes with this report is that we can sort of give an example of some of the countries that have succeeded and, and some of the very specific ways that they have done that. So, um, you know, I wouldn't I would encourage countries to really look to to others who ha are a little bit further along in the process uh, as examples. And I think some of the the themes that really emerged from our report um, are things like working closely the TB program and the HIV program together, to, especially when it comes to um, the rollout of TB preventive therapy. Um, so that type of collaboration and data sharing and transparency and, and partnership um, was really integral to um, the success of countries in scaling up um, TPT. Uh, whereas, say for for uh, for other regimens, um, you know, different uh, things emerged to to the forefront. Like, for instance, for um, B Palm, look at the example of really scaling up diagnostic capacity and infrastructure in order to support the rollout um, of these regimens. Uh, something that was cross-cutting um, through all the different regimens and, and all the different countries was the need to involve civil society and affected community members in um, the messaging around the new um, regimens in terms of sensitizing both the community to what existed and also healthcare workers to um, to support them to offer these new treatments. So uh, I think, you know, looking to countries that are maybe from a similar context. So for instance, in Eastern Europe, Europe, looking to Ukraine and seeing what are some of the ways that they have successfully implemented these policies would hopefully provide some good starting steps um, for, for, for countries that aren't there yet. Um, and uh, David, please feel free to add. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Madeline. Hi, everyone. Um, so ju just to add um, what countries can be doing um, to improve access to the shorter, safer regimens, Madeline touched on a lot of the, the key points. Um, and uh, I just want to also um, add a little bit of context to the Global Fund uh, funding request data that we used uh, in the report. Um, so this is um, this is data that is representing country plans 
for scaling up um, the, the shorter, safer regimens um, and not necessarily implementation. Some of the countries have started implementing uh, already, some haven't yet and have plans to. Um, and also there's a question mark around um, whether uh, these interventions are going to be fully funded by the Global Fund and how the distribution between domestic funding and Global Fund funding will apply. Um, and so I think that while we saw these positive trends uh, of countries planning um, to roll out these regimens, um, as Madeline uh, uh, talked through in the, in the findings of the report, um, the actual implementation and the data on the implementation, there's there's still a good a long way to go to get um, to full implementation. Uh, and so there's also like a, a question um, related to like now that we have this data, we ha we have, we have these country plans, like actually engaging uh, uh, country governments um, at the national level. Um, and at the regional level to to think about what what is what are the next steps here um and you know one thing is is really uh doing the demand creation work um raising awareness about these regimens um showing that uh the benefits of them and then demanding them uh, from country governments um and then it's also a question about data like where where are we going to find out whether the countries are um, are fully implementing them or not. Um, and, uh, and then of course, this also, you know, just ties into people being diagnosed. So that's why the diagnostics are really a core part of, um, the campaign. Uh, and, you know, and then, so there's, there's really an opportunity, I think, for, uh, country accountability, um, to move forward. Uh, but then also looking at some of the global actors, um, that have a role to play, um, WHO, for example, the Global Fund as a major market shaping actor, Unitaid. Uh, we we haven't seen a lot of progress on on the four regimens, um, and uh, for four HPMZ especially, we want to start seeing it implemented um, in in high burden settings um, through operational research and to really understand how to how to scale it up more widely. Um, and so there's a role that these other global actors can be playing as well. Um, and to think about uh, in our advocacy as well, uh, asking these actors to step in and take on a greater uh, a greater role. David, thank you very much, David, for this answer. And Madeline, thank you so much for your input. And in our chat, there is quite a big question, and it's in, in English. And maybe I should probably read it in English. As long as I'm in the Russian channel now. Dear Madeline, and can you see that question in English? It's in the chat. Yes, I can. I'm just reading this it means... now. Um, and and if the person who asked the question wants to come off mute and 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 say their question, that's welcome as well. It seems like it's a question about um, about uh, how community members, community agents that work on health promotion can get uh, assistance in, am I getting it right that it's just deciphering um, test information? So if if that's the question, I think um and Hi Doc. Oh. Hi everyone. Hi. Yes, it's me that asked the question. Uh the question that I'm trying to ask is that as um because I'm from South Africa. So uh in South Africa, yes, we already had like a few programs launched uh in terms of them campaigning about like the awareness of what you guys are talking about at this current moment. So what I'm asking is that uh, how do we then, uh, like the work that you guys do, uh, how does it involve, because I have not seen much about 
uh, the community uh, members, the people that do health promotions. I'm not yet talking about nurses. I'm talking about us promoting the campaign to the people so they know about these treatment plans. They know about these medications that are available so that people can, once they are educated about it, I think it will be much more simpler for them to acquire these uh, medications if uh, they need them. I don't know if you guys uh, can hear me. Yes, I thank you for clarifying. You know, it's a great question. Um, and I think a really strong component of this campaign is all of the materials that have been developed to support um, a lot of it geared at, you know, activists um, in terms of advocating to their governments and, and to international actors around these shorter regiments. But I think there's also a lot of materials that are relevant in terms of um, helping support patient education so um, we can post, maybe David, you could post the link to the campaign materials in the chat. Um, so I would encourage you to look through there. I think there's a lot um, there that could be used that's more appropriate kind of patient facing digestible information. Also uh, GFAN prepared a number of briefs specifically for communities to advocate to the um, uh, country coordinating mechanisms um, for in including the shorter regiments in their global fund proposals, but those are a lot of the, the key information. I think one challenge is, I mean, you're in South Africa, so I think there is, um, you know, that's a good context where to focus on patient education, you know, it would be a challenge. Um, obviously, it's important for patients to know what's accessible to them, but in countries where they wouldn't actually be able to procure those regimens, I think that would be an important, um, you know, just caveat because they're not available um, anywhere. And maybe I can take that opportunity just to answer um, Alice's question in the chat. Yes, bee palm is available in a large number of, of TB endemic um, countries and it, specifically for ones that are um, rolling out bee palm with global fund funding or planning to, as David um, mentioned in his remarks, that's all detailed um, in the report as well. A and additionally, the uh, World Health Organization does track rollout of bee palm specifically. So there's more data on that in the 2023 um, uh, WHO uh, global TB report as well. I hope that answered your question. Yes, Madeline, thank you so much for this very detailed uh, answer. There is one more raised hand, Maria. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. So hello again, everyone. My name is Maria Shubayeva, and I work in the coalition of ITPC in EECA countries. Most of the time I'm involved in intellectual property and access issues, accessibility issues. So like how patents might inhibit the access. It's not a question I just wanted to add because the bee palm regimen is really important. So by the way, thank you very, really much for this presentation for a lot of updated information that you have provided. Just wanted to say a little bit what we do with regards to access to BPAL in the EECA countries. Uh, for example, in Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, these countries do monitor uh, and collect data with regards to access to BPAL regimens and other TB drugs in 2023 it was done and they see what clinical recommendations are what patients use what are the national uh, level programs that they might use it under and in this summer we are going to publish our report and include the, these data there this is the first report of this type and this experience is really nice so thank you thank you and with regards to accessibility and access we also submitted uh, so far there is no patent in eurasian space for bpal there is a request and at this point of time this the patent is not provided not uh, uh, given yet 
but we filed uh, our objection to the European A Patent Agency, not only with regards to BPAL, but to other granulate and amorphic form as well of protomonide amorphic form. And our chemists, uh, they considered it a blocking drug. So now we are getting ready uh, to work with regards to protomonide. We will try to do our best in order for those patents not to be given uh, for these drugs. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that and really look forward to reading your report if it's available in English. <laughs> It is going to be ready closer to the fall. So each country is going to be uh, ha to have its country report, and we are going to publish them on ITPC, uh, ITPCA, EECA websites. Thank you, Marie.